Okay, uh, let's take a look at 1 Thessalonians. I got all my business done up here. Uh, to get into the Lord's business now. Uh, so, and we're looking at verses 17, 18, 19, and 20. Remember, we broke our second chapter down by what I believe Paul, how Paul dealt with it, with the brethren. He dealt with four different issues with the brethren in the church of Thessalonica. And I just find it really interesting, uh, verses 17, 18, 19, and 20. But we brethren, there was his, what I call a marker, but we, brethren, having been taken away from you, isn't that interesting? Having been taken away from you. And you're going to understand why he says that. It, he, that's an interesting, I was, I was taken away from you. And, and what he's dealing with is not by, not by my will. It wasn't my will to leave. That's the idea. I was taken away from you for a short while in person, not in spirit, were all the more eager with great desire to see your face. But we wanted, he's talking about we, the missionary team, but we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, more than once, and yet Satan hindered me, or us, for who is our, and he asked two questions, these are rhetorical questions, and and listen, I'm going to give you a little Greek here. I'm not going to translate. I'm not going to pound it out in Greek, but I'm going to tell you what this means. This is in the middle of a thought. And therefore, it's a, what we refer to as a rhetorical a parenthesis. A rhetorical parenthesis. It's in the middle of a conversation, and he, inter, he interjects it. And when you see that, it's, it's of great, he's saying, and this is of great importance to me to you. I want you to know how important you are to me in my ministry. And so notice the two questions, they're rhetoricals, used in the most unique way in a conversation. For who is our hope or joy or crown of exaltation? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming. See the two questions. And then he comes back. For you are our glory and joy. Okay. So he does something that's really unique and interesting. And it shows how emotionally attached he's become to these people. And he wants them to know that. Um, and he's only known them for three weeks. So I find that, I find this whole idea. And so my subject today comes from the idea of the crown. He says, you're my hope, my joy, my glory, and my crown of, exalta of exaltation. And so that's really important. In three weeks, these people have become what, what he says uh, in words like um, eager, my, 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 I am more eager to be back with you and great desire to see you and, and um, to be back face to face with you. And, uh, and, and he refers to their, rela their spiritual relationship as one of, of joy, of hope, of glory, and of a crown of ex exaltation. So it's, it's pretty unique and that Look, it was only three weeks. And you've probably had experiences like this with, with people that are believers that you just made a contact with that was, you know, in some ways a life contact. These people just became that close to you in a very short period of time uh, in the Lord. Now, he, he, the, it's a spiritual relationship that he's talking about here in the Lord. So let's have a word of prayer, and we're going to talk about this to see how prevalent this idea is in our own personal life. I mean, it, we have ministry one to another, spiritual gifts, uh, spiritual growth, uh, friendships. Um, but how unique are they to your life? 
I mean, how would you describe him? Paul described him as joy and hope and glory and crown. And pr pretty, those are pretty strong words about a relationship. Uh, and uh, so let's have prayer. Remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. Can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude types. It could be sins of the tongue or overt sins. What do I do to get out of carnality? Out of 1 Corinthians 3, 1 and 3. How do I get out of that? Back into spirituality, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Confess my sin. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he, God, is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. Cleanse us takes us back to the cross. As a believer, we're back at the foot of the cross. Not for salvation, but for sanctification. The ministry of the Holy Spirit. Uh, bringing the life of God into our daily walk and experiences in our life. That's sanctification. When you come to the cross for salvation, you get justification. And that holds you for your whole life and eternity. The sanctification, the indwelling power ministry of the Holy Spirit is what makes the New Covenant Church Age such a dynamic idea. So when you confess your sin, you come to the, to the Lord and he cleanses you. He de deals with all sin for the unbeliever and for the believer when he dies on the cross, one death for all sin. It's a powerful idea and it's one that you should... And listen, when you commit a sin, you confess it. I don't care what time of the day or, or what you're doing. When the Holy Bear, Bear, Spirit blows the whistle on you, says time out, you need to do that. Even if you're in the midst of a heated conversation, the Holy Spirit goes like, boom, hey, come on. That's a mental attitude sin. What do you do? You take a break from the argument. That's what you do. All that is is flesh. You confess your sin, and then you get back with the ministry of the Holy Spirit and carry the conversation to a spiritual place where you can actually have prayer and be loving one to another, where you're the hope and the joy and the glory and the crown. Just saying. So let's do that. Let's do that today, and then we'll get into our study. Father, we're thankful today for these that have come our way by the automobile and the internet. I pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of our lesson today about our spiritual relationships one to another, both with our mates and our children and our kin people, our church, our neighborhoods, places where we work and have ministry opportunities to reflect our relationships with the Lord. Now, how many people in our life could we describe as our hope and joy and glory and crown, our crown of boasting, our crown of exaltation. We ought to have a lot of those people in our life. And it shouldn't take a long time to get there if it's spiritual. For Paul, it was three weeks. Encourage our hearts today, Father, through the study of the Word of God out of 1 Thessalonians 2, 17 through 20, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, for Paul, this was quite an experience when he went in there. You know why he had to leave in a hurry, because he was under persecution, and he was driven out. And he left a wonderful church behind. He went in there. With an open door to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, there was positive volition to the gospel. There was a resp positive response to the gospel. People got saved. Paul spent three, three weeks hoping to spend longer with him, apparently from his conversation. He wanted to spend more time. He couldn't wait to get back because they, they just wanted to know so much of the word of God. And being a, a wonderful teacher, it was his joy to teach him. It was his hope to teach him. They were his joy to teach. They were his glory to teach. 
because it was all about the Lord Jesus Christ. It wasn't about Paul. It wasn't about Thessalonica. It wasn't where they came from or what was their background. It was the common denominator. It was the gospel of grace salvation and their interest in the word of God categorically taught by Paul. And he apparently did a very good job because after three weeks, after he left, and listen, they, when Paul went into the city, they had long sessions. Paul didn't say, well, let's, let's, let's meet for two hours. <laughs> Uh, he preached all day long. People came and left, you know. I got to go to work. Well, I'll be here when you come back. But anyhow, and so it, this is a, a, a wonderful idea uh, that he talks about, and he uses the word crown. Now, usually when we think of crowns, we think of eternity. The judgment seat of Christ will get the crown, uh, hopefully, uh, doesn't have to be, hopefully, if you understand how you get the different crowns. But he's not talking about the crown in eternity. He's talking about the crown in time. These people were his crowns now. You're my joy now. You're my hope now. You're my glory now. Right now. And that's interesting. That's really interesting. And I want to carry that idea forward today in my lesson with you, this crown. I, I wrote the Greek words down there because this word, Stephanos, is the word for crown. It's the one that's used with us when we talk about the crown of life and the crown of righteousness and et cetera. In eternity, it is a crown. And uh, you, you know where you put a crown? What part of your body do you wear the crown? Yeah, in fact, they refer to your head uh, and your hair as a crown, don't they? Yeah, you wear it on your head because it's, it's, it represents glory. It re represents a whole lot of things by, the, by the, where you wear it. You don't wear it on your arm or on your leg. Uh, it's not a, a bracelet for your ankle or your wrist. It's a crown. You wear it on your head where your soul is. It's where you wear it. Represents This crown represents your relationship with other believers. Isn't that interesting? I find it to be interesting. And then, then the word for uh, exaltation is, is, is kind of interesting because in the English, we would call that, we would refer to that as probably boasting. A crown of boasting this word would be most often used in the English language as boasting, exaltation. Something, something really special between these two people, something really special in this relationship that, was a, a, that caused a lot of boasting to go on in the Lord, boasting in the Lord. What was going on between the relationship was a lot of boasting in the Lord. Listen, that ought to be the characteristic of a spiritual mature believer when he meets other believers or in the, his relationship in his own life, husband to wife, parents to children, uh, people connected with their kin, people, their community, their church. This is an encouragement for you and I. And where, where is this in our life? We may have a few examples. Listen, Paul gave it to a whole group. Think about that. He didn't, gave it to a whole group of people. This is a large group of people. He refers to them in a plural. And his team understood it. When he talks, he talks we in the we. I mean, his team understood that. They all had that spiritual growth maturity about their life in their ministry. They all wanted it. They wanted to get them saved, and they wanted to get connected with them in a spiritual growth relationship in the Lord. Where, that, where they, they had common ground in the Lord to celebrate and boast on, on their hope and their joy and their glory and their crown of boasting. So I want to look at five things today. 
on this subject matter of the crown of exaltation. I want to begin by asking you a question. Is there anyone in your life today that could be described as your hope, your joy, your glory, and your crown in Christ? Because this is the point of our lesson. This is not a crown we're going to get later. It's a crown we get now. Point number one, I want to examine the text. I read it to you. I want to show you three parts. I want to show you three parts. Now, what's interesting is there's a sentence In uh, verse 7 and 8, they got two questions in 19 and then another, another uh, period. So that makes it really interesting. You got, a, you got a sentence, a sentence. You have a rhetorical parenthesis and another sentence. See, that's what makes this, the two rhetorical questions dynamic. In the midst of a conversation, he stopped and he made, he, he asked two que rhetorical questions. A sentence, a sentence, a rhetorical parenthesis, and another sentence. In the Greek language, that's really important. And that's how you identify importance of this. And so the two questions that he asked, who is our hope, our joy, our crown of exaltation, is it not even you in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? The answer is yes. <clears throat> yes, it is. And so what Paul deals with in verse 7, in that first sentence, what he deals with is separation. It's a really interesting word. Would you look on your paper? See the word orphan? AP, that's a preposition, apo, A-P-O. You don't put a double O, so you, you, you don't need another O. But that's a preposition on the front of it. Now, now see O-R-P-H-A-N, see the word orphan? That's what this word is. That's exactly what this word is. It's an aorist passive participle, nominative plural masculine. And related to our story, Paul went in there. Well, I'll come back to it in a minute. This word means to be rendered an orphan. Something occurred that caused this child to be an orphan. Something occurred, apo, something occurred that caused this child to be an orphan. That's the aorist tense of a point in time this happened. And, and what we find out in this, in this, having been taken away from you, having been taken away from you, And he felt like he had left an orphan. To be rendered an orphan, he used it, used it metaphorically. Paul's feeling of loss by having to leave suddenly when he wanted to stay with his new family in Christ. See, Paul used this interesting word. Now, you can't see it in the English, you, but it, you, they do give you kind of a heads up in the English when they say, having been taken away from you. That's this, this idea of an orphan. Something occurred in, the, in life that caused the, that he used it metaphorically. That's the way he felt when he was torn away from them. That's the way he felt. He felt separated uh, unintentionally. Then in verse 18, Paul, I used the word Satan because he did. For we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, more than once, yet Satan hindered us. Maybe your Bible, if you have a King James Bible, they would have called it dwarfed. Hindered is the idea in the Greek. And notice, 
that in verse 17, I have an aorist passive participle. And now in verse 18, he wants to connect that. Paul wants to connect that. His suddenly leaving and not able to get back to them as a hindrance of Satan. And he puts it in the aorist active indicative. The aorist, aorist participle occurs because he was hindered. He was hindered. He was pushed out, which made him, made them made him feel like they were orphan. He had to leave children behind as orphans, not grown yet in the word. And he couldn't get back to them because Satan hindered it. Satan can hinder. This would be Paul's point. Satan can hinder our plans, but he can never hinder God's. So you always remember it. He can hinder your plans, but he can't hinder his God's. Look, at God sent him in there, allowed him to be pushed out, and he couldn't get back. That was his plans. God kept sending him forward. Satan can hinder your plans, but can never hinder God's. Now, you know the story of Job, right? You should go back and read Job 1 and 2. That will confirm this idea in your life. Now, he can hinder your, he can hinder your plans, but he can't. Listen, Satan don't have power. Listen. He can only mess with you. He can't do anything about it. Plan of God is always going to work forward in your life. Agreed? He don't have power over the, over the word of God. But he does have power over yours. <laughs> he can hinder your plans. And sometimes that's a good thing. In fact, all the time it's a good thing. Because God's plan moves forward on it. And this is, this is what... We learn from the life of Job for sure. Also, write this down. I don't think I have that on your paper. Uh, write down Luke 22, 31, 32. This is Luke's account uh, with Peter, Jesus having a conversation with Peter. When Peter is pushing back on Jesus' uh, teaching that he's got to go to the cross and die, be buried and raised from the dead the third day. That, that's why God sent him. I'm the messianic savior of the world. I'm the redeemer, talked about over and over in the Old Testament. And when you read that, Jesus tells Peter, Peter, Satan has requested permission to sift you like wheat. I'm going to pray for you because it's going to happen. And when it's over, I want you to go back and strengthen the brethren. Remember that? Look. Sifting like wheat. Now, I'm an old farm boy. Some of you are. Some of you came off farms. Sifting was a good thing, wasn't a bad thing. Because you know what it did? It separated the what from the what? The shaft from the grain, right? What was important to the, what was important to the farmer? What was the most important to the farmer? The grain, the product. Because it is the seed that the sower uses to sow another harvest, right? You know, the parable of the sower. Listen. You do know that Satan's have, having these conversations with God about you. You say, I, I, it may be you, Ron, but not me. I hear that all the time. No, I mean you. Are you a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ? Yes. Do you believe that you should walk in the power of the Spirit, not the flesh? Yes. 
Do you believe that you should walk by faith and not by sight? Yes. Do you love the word of God? Do you believe that it is the joy of your life? That's, you, that's when you're having trouble, you go to the word of God, and the word of God brings you comfort, and the Holy Spirit brings comfort, and God brings you comfort. You believe that? Well, that means the devil's got your name down. But God has too. And when he comes up and he, 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 he brings your name up before the throne and the Father, the Father looks in the book and there's your name and, and how, how life is going. And God says to Satan just exactly how he evaluates you, yada, yada, yada. And based on those things, what Satan requests, he gets permission based on what God sees in the character of your life in the book. I'm just making that as an illustration because in God's heart, you don't, he don't need a book. I know that. I'm just telling you. We need a book, right? We need the book of life. We need the, the book of the Word of God. Your life will be sifted, and that's a good thing. When you go through it, you don't go through it alone. The Lord never leaves you nor forsakes you. And it develops your spiritual maturity and your spiritual growth and the status of victory. Right? 1 John 5, 4. Faith is what? That does what? Overcomes the world. Who's, who's the ruler of the world? Satan. God's the ruler of everything. But... 1 John 5, 19, Satan, the evil one, is the ruler of the world. See, that's what it's all about, isn't it? Satan's gained permission to, put you, to, to run the angelic conflict through your life, to run it through your life, not by you, but through you. <laughs> when he comes and asks permission, the father looks in the book, so to speak, looks at your character and where you are in your life and what kind of faith you have to go through it, and that's what he allows him to do. Agreed? Oh, my goodness. People, read the book of Job again. It's a long book, but you need it. You need to read the whole book because the end of the book is where the happy ending is. <laughs> my point is Luke 22. See, that's my point. Luke 22, Satan can hinder, right? He can hinder. He can certainly hinder man's plans, but he can't hinder his God plan. And listen, he can only sift you based on your capacity that God allows him. He, you see it in Job 1, and you see it in Job 2. There's no doubt about that, that doctrinal principle. Now, what, in my opinion, Paul, Paul is encouraging me, encouraging me on in this passage, me as, an, as a believer in Christ, is sweet fellowship. What he was separated from was sweet fellowship. These are words. Listen to the words. Hope, joy, glory, and crown. He's talking about in time. This is how this, this relationship of hope and joy and glory and crown. This is where we find the two rhetorical points, the two rhetorical questions. This is where the conversations are interrupted and they're interjected, and then he closes with it. You are our glory and our joy. You are such as this. That's a powerful idea, and Paul has well established it in the language. Point number two, for Paul, it was directed, this whole idea was directed towards a whole group of believers, not just individuals, but a whole group. That says a lot about this group, and it says a lot about what Paul was looking for, develop spiritual relationships. What was the commonality? Where can we find compatibility spiritually with other people? Well, you and I both know we start with salvation. Are we on the same page of salvation? 
we, then we look for, are we on the same page in spirituality? Are we on the same page, the importance of walking in the spirit, not the flesh? And the third, we're looking for commonality in spiritual growth maturity so that we can walk by faith, not by sight. Listen, most of us, we get there. We've got a lot of common ground and compatibility to find in our relationship one with another as believers in Christ, joy and hope and glory and a lot of reasons for boasting in Christ. You know, here, here's the crown. I think a lot about him. I mean, every day I pray for all of our missionaries, and I pray for people in my church and all that. And I feel that way about Billy Morgan. And a lot of these people, the Williams, I know, listen, I just knew them for a short time, and I knew them. There was just that common, compatible ground of excitement and joy and hope and our glory in the Lord. And, and listen, I know you have that, and, and, and that's a wonderful thing. I hear Rick on the men's prayer breakfast do this all the time with his with his people that he's connected with overseas. And, and, and when Jackie come, came back from a foreign trip, she had that same connection and had that same stuff going on. And I know you do too. I mean, it doesn't just have to be those. I mean, my daughters and my son, they talk about their connections with people through their work and all that. And, and how they meet some people, they just immediately bond with them in the Lord. And they, 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 they have now mutual joys and hopes and glories and crowns. They think about them all the time in their prayer life. That's, for me, what the crown of boasting is about. I mean, I see Billy over there, and I see him doing those things. I remember when he was just... Just a kid running around the church. And the, my crown is to have a, a, a small segment of, of time with that kid. I know, Mary, you have the same way from, from, uh, from a, a family concept. We all have that. And this is what Paul is trying to tell us. You may have this and not have realized it. This is a wonderful thing. It's a, a great sign of spiritual maturity and connecting to people. I was talking to Deanna here not long ago, and I, she said, I, I, I've got to go to Aniana and take dinner. I, where are you going at Aniana with dinner? You going to Aniana to eat? No, she said, I've prepared dinner. I'm going to take it up there. Because she, she had a patient that she had connections with and ministry involvement. And they were going through a hard place in their life, COVID-related and all of that. And what was she doing? She was wearing a crown. And she was doing it because of the hope and the joy and the glory that's connected with a relationship of compatibility with other believers. When you're going through a hardship, your crown, you put your crown on because your mind goes like, I've got to go help these people. This is not optional. I just got to go help them. They didn't ask for it. I've got to go help them. Why? Where does that come from? This is what Paul is talking about. It comes from a spiritual relationship. You, you find some commonality in, the, in Christ, and all of a sudden it blossoms, and there it is. See, you may have it and haven't thought about it before. Paul has certainly brought our attention to this subject. 
There was only one way that that could happen so easily and quickly. It's based on both people having the same relationship with God through Christ and the gospel. They had, there had to be some common grounds. And conversation and connections make that. And that's a powerful idea. That's a powerful idea. It's wonderful. A lot of times, it's only one going one way, and it's all ministry in it. And that's okay. But when it clicks, and they begin to come back to you and, 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 and share some of their spiritual experiences, and they're be beginning to get into the Word of God, now it's a, that, that whole thing becomes different in your life and ministry with them, doesn't it? There's a really, there's a hope and a joy and, a, and, and glory that comes out of that. That's what Paul is talking about. The, the gospel brought them together, and the word of God attached them in the most unique ways because they were now, and listen, Paul made sure that they both, he and they understood that they were now of the same family with the Abba Father, Right? And when he was taken away, when he was taken away, he felt like he left behind the orphans. And that, and that he didn't, did he? Because they belonged to Abba Father. But he didn't think he didn't feel like he was able, in his own mind, his plans, that he was able to get him to a place that he would have liked to have gotten him. But the father pushed him out. You see that? Well, listen now, Paul, Paul, the English describes it a little different, having been taken away from you. But in the Greek, it speaks how a, a deeper sadness in his soul because he felt he left him behind unattended, unparented. He couldn't leave one of his guys. And Paul knows that God is their Abba Father, and he certainly established that. That's why he felt that he'd left them, and he wanted to get back to them and finish teaching them. That's this relationship, the connection. You will meet believers with whom you are immediately bond because you have the same spiritual growth capacity in Christ, or you might say we're on the same page spiritually. Three. Listen, Satan can only hinder the plans that man has for his life. He, can't, he cannot interfere with God's. Make sure you get that. I wouldn't want you. And, then, and listen, God signs off on everything that goes through your life. I say it all the time. God has to sign off on anything that goes through your life, right? That's Job 1 and 2. My, my, my. When I see a blank look in your face, it bothers me. <laughs> you should know that. Nothing can pass through your life as a, you, your father is Abba, Abba Pater. All he can, listen, all, all, he can, all, the, all the devil can do is sift you, and that's a good thing. Is that a good thing? Well, it is, you know. I can't take you outside and show you how you do that and why it's good, but just imagine it. In 1 Thessalonians 2, 8, that probably should be 18. That should be 2, 18. In 1 Thessalonians 2, 18, Satan hindered, and I gave you the Greek on that, hindered, that's a good, it, it, you may say dwarfed, but hindered is the good... And what it's a military term, or it could be used in the military uh, for cutting off a main supply route. The enemy always uses that. That's warfare. And this is warfare. And so I took that illustration, cut off the main supply route. And it's translated separate. Separate, separate the, the troops separate but listen he can hinder man's plans but he can't hinder God's I don't want you to misunderstand that all right and I'll tell you another thing can't hinder Paul's affections for the people right the hindrance just sparked it 
the hindrance to get back to him, the, his inability to get back to him right away, just sparked the love affair that he had with him. Well, he used, he used very strong words. Joy. Right? Hope. Glory. These are strong words. Satan can use obstacles. You remember what in Matthew 16, 21 through 23, when J Jesus was talking with Peter, and, he, and, and Peter rebuked Jesus' teaching on his death, burial, and resurrection, and, and, and he said, get behind me, Satan. You're a what? You're a stumbling block to me. A stumbling block. And what's that do? Well, it's an obstacle in your way. Right? It's an obstacle in your way. It's an obstacle in your way. Satan used obstacles, or what Jesus referred to as stumbling blocks, to hinder the church age believer's operation in the plan of God. But listen, it's, they, he can just put obstacles in the way. He just step over and go on. You still drive forward. I mean, look, Jesus, he says, Peter, what you don't realize, Satan's using you by your negativity, challenging what I know I have to do in the plan of God, using you as a stumbling block. But what Jesus did would just step over him, right? He just stepped over the stumbling block. Then it didn't, it didn't prevent him doing the Father's plan or will, right? Not my will, but thy will be done. Not Peter's will, but the Lord's will be done. The Satan put, can put the obstacles, but they're just, listen, it's just a distraction, though, of where you've got to go, what you've got to do. You don't focus on it. You focus on the mission, You do know that, don't you? My, grandpa, my grandmother, Holman, when I was a young boy coming up, she used to say to me when I was, probably when I reached puberty, she began this conversation with me, absent makes the heart grow fonder for someone new or for that someone special in your life. Absence will either, either make you be interested in somebody else or it will really rev it up and make you really interested in the person he's, he's brought you to. And boy, was my grandmother right. I don't know where she got all that. She was really right. My grandmother was really wise. I was reminded of my grandmother's wisdom when I heard, when I read Paul's description of how he felt in his sudden absence or separation from the Thessalonians' believers. I thought about that. I hadn't thought about that in years. I used to think about it a lot, though. When I went off to college and went off to war and went off to ministry and did this and did that, I used to think about that a lot, especially when I was in relationships. For we wanted, Paul said, for we wanted to come to you. I, Paul, more than once, yet Satan hindered me. He says, we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short time, while in person, but not in spirit. Isn't that interesting? That was my grandmother's point. You could be absent from the person. It should make your heart grow fonder for a, re for a reunion, a reconnection. When the absence is removed, he wrote, we're all, we were all the more eager with great desire. Look how strong those words are. Look how strong those words are. 
He's talking about a spiritual relationship with another person, not a carnal one. He's talking about the things that he felt strongly about in their relationship, their spiritual relationship. Both Paul and the Thessalonian believers had the same spiritual love for one another in the Lord and in the Lord's word. You should read 1 Corinthians 7, 39, 9, 5, and 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 16 to tell you how to build a proper relationship where that can flow. It's got to be in the Lord. can't be in the flesh. It's got to be in the spirit. can't be in the world. It's got to be in the word. You got to be on the same page spiritually for this to occur that we're talking about. Notice how absence has been a positive effect on Paul's on Paul's feelings regarding the spiritual relationship he has with the Thessalonians. That's powerful, and that's a spiritual connection, just like he talked about in First Corinthians, the third chapter. Point number five in closing. Respect, respect for a spiritual relationship with other people should be allowed to grow in Christ. And what it does, it produces, watch this now, fragrant memories. That's why a journal is good for you. Because you can go back in your journal and you think about something that triggers you and you go back and you look and you write down how your feelings and what's going on, the circumstances. And it's amazing to me the importance of fragrant memories. And sometimes we miss them. I mean, we, something occurs, and, but when you go back and you take a look and, and then certain things trigger it back and you go like, oh, wow, I remember that. Boy, was that something. Fragrant memories. Listen, a good relationship has fragrant memories. A, a good, healthy, a good, healthy spiritual relationship has fragrant memories. There, there ought to be things about your relationship that just bring out the good, fragrant, positive memories in your life. Paul said that out of sight did not mean out of spirit. All the more eager, Paul wrote, and with greater desire, I desire to see your face. Paul is showing that a healthy spiritual relationship, watch this now, can, can withstand absence but not neglect. You ought to circle that. A good spiritual relationship, they can withstand absence but not neglect. He is making contact with these people long distance by letter. We would probably do it with our phones. The question to be answered today, honestly, is why are, there separ why are we separated and for how long? When you have a relationship with somebody, you should ask that, so those questions. Why are we separated and for how long are we separated? And they ought to be good, honest answers with spiritual understanding. If you can get it into a spiritual realm, you will find that you will find in absence the fragrant memories, fragrant memories of joy and hope and glory and crown, meaning that when I think about these people, I have fragrant memories. I want to pray for them. I want to do this. I want to do that. It's a positive. It's not a negative. Can you hold your confidence and the boast of your hope firm to the end? Well, you can in Hebrews 3, 6, God's will. Standing firm by faith on God's word and his promises is where you find your crown of your relationship with other people.
Remember, in this absence, you are never alone. And if your relationship has been built right, it's built on fragrant memories that you can carry all your life in a positive way. Write this verse down and later in the day, read it. This will be helpful to you in our study. Philippians 4.1. Philippians 4.1. That goes along with this. 